Christopher Lee is the president and CEO of the Los Angeles-based CEL and Associates Incorporated, one of the nation's leading consulting organizations specializing in strategic planning, compensation, benchmarking, opinion surveys, and performance improvement in the real estate industry. Mr. Lee is an acknowledged leading futurist, as, thank you, has a PhD in management in organizational development, and has over 30 years, for over 30 years, has been an advisor to real estate companies nationwide. Mr. Lee is also the editor of Strategic Advantage, which is a monthly electronic newsletter that has a futurist perspective of the real estate industry. Uh, Chris's opinions and forecasts regularly appear in trade publications. He's a frequent speaker at industry conferences, such as this one. For over 20 years, his firm has conducted the nation's largest compensation survey in the real estate industry. And in 2013, Chris's firm will conduct approximately 2 million customer opinion surveys. CEL and Associates client lists reads like a who's who in the real estate industry. Perhaps the best indicator of the demand for his services is the fact that he has accumulated, and I just got the correction on this, it's no longer 8 million, 9 million frequent flyer miles. So without any further delay, I would like to introduce you to your next guest speaker, Christopher Lee. Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you. Um, these are exciting times to be in the real estate industry. This is a uh, my presentation is not gloom and doom, it's about excitement, opportunity, and where things are going to go and why it's exciting for you to be in this space at this time. Um, these are truly transformational times in our industry. We are not just transitioning, we are transforming our industry into something very exciting, very dynamic, where we can take absolute leadership roles in where this industry goes. And today, today, my presentation is going to take the following, following subjects. I'm going to talk about some future headlines. These are headlines that you might see in the future. Things that are likely to happen in our industry. Things that I think will make you think that what you thought you understood about our industry is going to be dramatically different when I get done today. I'm going to talk about the mega shifts that have occurred and what are occurring today going into the future. I will talk about clearly some of the demographic changes which are going to drive incredible demand and incredible opportunities in multiple areas, including Florida for sure, and going forward. Talk about the psychology of real estate, because real estate is based a lot on psychology, and you'll see why that makes sense today, and I'll show you the proof points of why psychology is indicating the kind of demand that will come out of various kinds of real estate space. I will talk about the real estate cycle, and then I'm going to end it with some predictions. Predictions that will happen in the next 10 years that you will see how our industry is changing. So this is going to be a very fast-paced, very exciting kind of time for each of you. If you'd like a copy of my presentation afterwards, just give me your card, I'll be glad to email it to you. You can share it with your staff. But these are truly exciting times, so let's get started here. So what are some of the future headlines you might see in our industry? You might see a headline like this. Now, how many are brokers in the room? Raise your hand. Okay, you're toast. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But the commoditization of real estate, the way real estate is being changed and bought on a flat world basis, 
is that we're going to see much more commoditization. And don't be surprised to see someone like eBay or others who begin to utilize ways of selling real estate across the globe. Don't be surprised to see a headline like this, where Congress is going to pass laws making it, making it standards, making it unlawful to sell a building that is not compliant. And you say, Chris, what does that mean? It means that what's going to happen probably is in discussions today that if you buy an apartment building, as an example, you may have to escrow monies to convert that building into the energy standards that the federal government has placed upon that industry and that building. That you will escrow monies to convert it not to a lead, not to an energy star, but to some standard because you real estate in commercial real estate in particular, but we use 70% of the electricity in this country as an example. Real estate is going to be the energy czar for America. Do not be surprised to something like this because that's how they will drive the change and efficiency inside our buildings. Don't be surprised to see something like this where the use of social media and how buildings get leased, how buildings get managed, what's going to happen here. We're going to see the utilization of that social media and far more than we've ever seen before. The print media is gone. The social media, Yelp and all the others, are very much going to dominate how the word gets out, how things are leased, how you go to shopping centers, what restaurants you go to, what retail centers you go to, who do by social media. Don't be surprised to see a headline like this. Marriott and Starbucks announced Zip Space, office space for the new generation. And you say, Chris, this is crazy. I'm not crazy, trust me. This right here. Uh, New York Times yesterday's article, Marriott announces where you can rent office space by the hour in Marriott. We are moving in which different kinds of space are going to be used for different kinds of purposes. And as that begins to happen, we're going to see this because the way that the 18 to 34 year olds conduct business is a lot different than the over 55 year olds conduct business. And so what happens in our office space will be dramatically different. When I hear about the predictions in the future, you'll see why that is. But don't be surprised if something like this. This will happen, it's already happening, it will happen in an accelerated basis. Don't be surprised to see a headline, a headline like this, where a high-rise farm equals 12 stories equals 600 acres. They say, maybe I can believe the other one, Chris, but I can't believe that. No, it's right here, it's in the paper. It's already going to be underway. Six, this 12-story building can produce 12,000 heads of lettuce. I mean, uh, 12, to, to, 12 million heads of lettuce in a given year. 12 million. The use and the type of use of buildings in our country and the way we view commercial real estate and multifamily and industrial retail real estate is changing and changing rapidly. So as you look to the future, it is bright, but you're going to have to change your business models. You're going to have to change your outlook. You're going to have to change the way you look at, at, at how you invest and how you develop. So what are some of the mega shifts, the things that are occurring in our industry? If you look at the, look, look at each one of these charts, so you will see. But clearly, as we go, in yesterday's model, in yesterday's model, the business focus was very local, very regional. We were collecting assets. We were having a market focus that was about seeking sites. You began to look at, at, at the platform as on the service alone. You can go down the list here. Each one of these things, the leadership was based on the founders, the entrepreneurs like Ron and others who started this industry. But that was the past. Today, we've moved further on that chart. Where our industry, in fact, we've gone from local, regional, to now regional and national. Where we've gone from our operating focus of collecting assets to collecting fees. Our market focus has changed. We're creating, obviously, um, uh, market share. And all down the list, leadership now has changed from that founder-based mentality to an executive-based mentality. That's where we are today. But as we make these mega shifts, we're moving into the, oh, moving into that direction. And tomorrow, in our industry, the business focus will be national and global. We are still a local business, but we are governed by national capital markets. And so that has a huge impact on the success of our organizations and, and our future. Our operational focus is no longer on collecting assets or fees. It's about collecting relationships. It's about the customer, whether it's a resident or a tenant or a client. It's about relationships. So how many relationships do you care that you, that you assemble, and how many of those are recurring? The market focus is about that customer share. And the leadership, as you see at the bottom, has changed. 
change to transformational. Because if you're going to lead your firm in the future, you have to be transformational. You cannot be stuck in the old ways of doing business. You cannot do the things that you did in the past. Our industry has changed dramatically. It's moving from left to right. And as that begins to happen, each of you will have to adapt and change as well. What's in and what's out? What's in today are knowledge cities, creative class cities, capital cities, healthcare, health cities, 24 7 cities, green cities, connected cities, all the ones on the left. And what's not applicable today is on the right hand side. And as real estate firms begin to look at what's in and what's out, and how they begin to look at that, they begin to change the dynamics of where they look to invest, how they look to operate, how they look to develop their platforms. These are exciting times, times of transformation, times of change, times in which these kinds of opportunities get created. But the other thing that's happening in our industry is very clear. We're absolutely transitioning from a founder-based industry to a successor-based industry. 60% of today's CEOs in real estate will no longer be there by the year 2020. The retirement and all the other things that are there. We are moving away from those founders back in the 1980s and 1990s into people who are the next generation leaders. And how they will take our industry into the future is the exciting part of that. But 60% of those will be gone. We're consolidating. There will be 30% fewer real estate firms in 2000, in 2000 if there were in 2000 than there will be um, in 2020. 30% fewer firms. Why? Because those founders are exiting, public firms, bankruptcy, other things. We are consolidating down and changing dramatically. Fewer firms means some tremendous opportunities for those out there who have the capital and the leadership to take advantage of that and to create that customer and market share we talked about. We're becoming very specialized. We do 2 million surveys a year in this industry, and we found out very clearly that only 20% of building owners today think that their service providers are best in class. Only 20%. I mean, it's 80% don't think that people who are providing the services that they're rendering right now are best in class. What an opportunity. These are not bad times. These are opportunity times. Times to capture where other people have been asleep at the switch. We're also facing a huge loan maturities. He has loaned $1.7 trillion in 2012, 2016. 29% of those loans are underwater. So there'll be a number of transactions, a number of sales. If you're investment sales, you'll do very well. All of these things are going to happen as we reformat the landscape and change the landscape as it goes on. So these are exciting times because it gives you an opportunity to be in places that are growing opportunity. But we're also going to face a talent shortage. We do not have enough young people in our industry. We do not have enough people here. And we, our forecast look at, we're going to be at least 15,000 or more annually. It's going to go to 25,000 very quickly. Because as those boomers begin to retire, we have not made ways in which we brought enough young people in. So everybody in this room who's under the age of 25, raise your hand. OK, you all are going to be millionaires soon. soon. Each one of you has a tremendous opportunity. Young people today are going to take hold. Our future is with the young people. Our future is with those who are educated, those who, in fact, can lead us into that next place. So step aside, boomers. The young folks are coming in here. But compensation is still going to be a high priority. But these are the turnover rates that are going to happen in our industry right now. You take a look at now in 2020. The number of CEOs, the CFOs, the EVPs, these are the senior staff. And so this is why University of Florida, the education programs that are being provided are so critical to the success of our industry and where it's going. Because these kind of turnover rates are going to be there. And these are exciting times, but they're times of transformation. We survey hundreds of CEOs each year and ask them what their priorities are. If you take a look at one, the number one priority of people today is human capital. It deals with who is going to be working in our firm. Remember, nothing, nothing, and real estate gets done without people. You can't buy a building, lease a building, acquire a building, finance a building, develop a building, construct a building. You can do nothing without people. And so without the right talent, that's where you will fail or you will succeed. And these priorities are very there. Customer relationship, number two. Brand management, number three. Business innovation, number four. If you have not redone your business model and put a new plan together, <coughs> you will not be successful into the future. These are the priorities that are being set. 
So what are some demographic trends? These are going to drive these opportunities. <coughs> Excuse me. Drive where it's going here. U.S. population is obviously expected to grow. We're going to go over 31 million residents. You can see the projections out there. The five top states for growth. The five top states for growth. California, Texas, Florida, Illinois, and Ohio. They will have a combined population of 119. Those states alone will be 35% of the population of the United States. That will control the House of Representatives, at least a third of them will be in that side. And minorities, particularly Hispanics, will be 71 to 73% of the population growth in this country. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Huge changes going on. Our population of Hispanics right there is growing. In 2010, Hispanics were only 16.3% of the U.S. population. But if you take a look at the growth that's happening there, there are 56% of the growth between the year 2000 2010 was Hispanic growth, was growth in the Hispanic population. And 76% 70 of Hispanics live in nine states. Texas and California are home to almost 50% of those. And close to 60%, about 57 to 50, 56 to 58% of Hispanics rent. So it's a huge opportunity going forward here. Plus 11 million unauthorized or undocumented Hispanics are in the country as well. These are exactly what's happening and is changing what is going on in the states throughout the South for sure. But the population of Sun Belt, where you are, is increasing. Who wants to be in Michigan? My God, you just sell it to Canada. Uh, but where the population is going is clearly here in the West and the South. The top 100 places where people want to retire, 77 of those are in the Sun Belt. And you begin to look at where you are, you are in the sweet spot of that. Let me show you. Taking some population statistics right now, 1950, U.S. Census Bureau numbers, watch the red dots. This is the red dots show population concentration. 1950, 1970, 1980. We're getting a little more red. You can see where Atlanta is. You can see where that is, is moving forward in Dallas. 2010. Look at what's growing there. 2020. This is why we like Virginia, we like Tennessee, we like Northern Florida. We like, you look at all those places. You know what's going to happen. That's just in 2030. So population is shifting, population is changing. The opportunities are out there. But you cannot sit there and wait for them to come to you. You have to go get them. You have to be the one that takes after them. The population over age 65 is growing, growing dramatically. You've got a huge number of those folks here in the state. Two, 20, in 2010, 30% of those are age 65 and above. By 2030, nearly 20% will be, uh, or 7 million, will be over the age of 65. This is huge, and healthcare expenditures are enormous. So when you begin to look at commercial buildings, you begin to look at things like that, that's why healthcare and MOBs and things are going to be more popular. So population, population is growing, Hispanics is growing, A over 65 is growing, and so those where they reside. Take a look at that little right-hand corner. The old folks don't want to live back where you're shoveling snow and changing the storm windows. They want to live where it's warm, want to live where it's comfortable, and so the south and the west are going to grow dramatically. You are going to have more people, not less people. The opportunities are sitting in front of you because of these demographic shifts. And so the labor force of that, young, of that group as well has changed. You can see in that last bullet point on the right-hand side there that the labor force of 55 has grown from 29% to 40% by January. What does that mean? It's because the economic condition today is such that the old folks are having to work longer because they lost money in their 401k, they lost savings rate, they lost some of their home value, and they're working longer. But once they get to a place where they can retire, they will, and this is why there is going to be a huge sound of people retiring over the next decade because they'll get to that place creating huge opportunities for young people in our industry, but also creating a void. Because if your company does not have enough young people, enough leadership development activities, if you're not growing it, it will be a struggle, a struggle for you to compete in today's world. And that population of 18 to 34 is growing. This is the group we love. This is the group that is our next generation. This is the group that will lead our country in the future. This is the group that will create the opportunity. Create the opportunities, help me out here. There we go, thank you. Um, and so you can see here that 77.2 million girls will be added between 2010 and 2020. And of that population, about 63% of those folks rent. What do they do? They get out of high school and they rent. When they go to college, they rent. When they come out of college, they rent. 
When they get engaged, they rent. When they get married, they rent. When they get their first divorce, they rent. Okay? <laughs> Those folks keep renting. We are moving to a renter-based society because everything from zip cars to iTunes, everywhere you go, is based upon a rental-based society. It's point and click rent for the moment. And as that happens, it's a huge opportunity based upon this 18 to 34 year olds that is there. We're also going back to the urban core. A lot of things that Ron works on, other things are based upon building housing for folks that don't have housing. And as we move back to the urban core, the densities are going to increase, and this population shows there. 85% of the US population lives in a metropolitan area. But what you happen here is as that begins to change, we're going to have more mixed-use projects, more podium projects. We're going to have more infill projects, smaller projects. But we're going to create the environment in which we can attract people that are going to live and work in the communities in which they reside and not have to commute. So this is changing. And a shift back to that core is happening. So what are these impacts that happen to our industry? What does it change? Well, the baby boomers right now are going to age in place. They're not going to necessarily leave. But we're going to have a quilt work, a quilt work of opportunities and a quilt work of where you can invest and make some pretty good money or opportunity for that. We're going to have new products, new products, new services that serve the needs of these new generations, the aging boomers, the Y generation coming out. Forget the extras. Who's the, who's the next generation? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. You're in your 35s and 40s. OK, you're host anyway, so you're gone. Um, because the Y generation is going to take over from the boomers. And the next generation is like bologna and sandwich, they're gone. Um, we're going to see core investing. We're going to see a rise in digital mode. We're going to see the increase in complexity and transformation of the global economy. That's going to create some psychological barriers. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But all of these things here, there will be geographic winners and there will be geographic losers. And so where you hook your wagon, how you hook your wagon, how you look at the statistics will clearly make the difference between whether you're a success, or also ran. But there are opportunities, and you can see them right here. Best state for business. This is in 2012, came out of there from, from uh, CEO Magazine. Florida ranks second, right behind Texas. You are, I'm not pessimistic about Florida. I'm not pessimistic as others have been. I think it's a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous place. You've got the wonderful science, mathematics, and engineering coming out of your colleges and universities. You have tremendous port activity. You have a tourism base. You have got so many dots in a row, so many places that connect. This is where the opportunity is going to be. And you have a chance to be at the leadership of that. And to change those communities and change those opportunities as you go forward here. But real estate is psychological. It's made up of psychology. And you know when I went to college, I probably skipped half my classes and slept through the other half. But as I go through there, one of the classes I enjoyed was psychology. And I ended up you know, studying Maslow. And if you study Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you will see that Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom is the pyramid becomes self-actualized at the top, and you've got to satisfy things at the bottom. And he basically said, and B.F. Skinner and others have said the same thing, when in fact you satisfy the basic core of human existence, you have to do that before you can do anything else. Shelter, wellness, you know, uh, food, those kind of things. So what I did is I applied those into research in terms of where it impacts real estate. If you take a look at this here, we have our cycle, I, I call it my, my, my psychological, psychology of needs here, but it's a hierarchy of economic vitality. The top is a robust economy. Then we go to revitalized economy, go to recovered economy, recessionary economy. You can take a look right there. We just came through a recessionary economy. We're just starting to move into recovery. So what's the hierarchy of real estate? Well, based on that, in a recessionary economy, and coming out of that, basic necessity real estate is what always wins. Just like Maslow or Skinner or others would say, is that you have to sign human needs first, have to have them provided. Then you go to productive real estate, niche real estate, discretionary. You say, well, Chris, what are those? Very simple. Let's see how this works, this flashlight. That's what it happens. When you were down a recessionary environment, the things that are always in demand, Apartments, grocery stores, pharmacy, and healthcare. What has led our real estate industry over the last couple of years has been those industries, right? Those sectors right there, those asset classes. We can't get into office and industrial or other things until we make sure we've got satisfied our jobs, we satisfy the economic basis there. It's the psychology, it's the consumer confidence. 
You cannot get up into the malls and hospitality and entertainment and the things that take discretionary dollars until you set aside the economic and social and behavioral needs of a population. This is why I'm so optimistic about multifamily, why I'm so optimistic about grocery and retail, why I'm so optimistic about those things in healthcare, because right now that's the opportunity because of the psychology of that. And the proof points are very simple. You take a look at home loan, I'm going to use multifamily as an example of that. Multifamily, I mean, uh, uh, home ownership, I'm going to use multifamily as an example. Home ownership here peaked about 69.2%. That was the peak up at that time. Now we're dropping down in the mid 60s. We think it will be in the low 60s. We think it'll be at 61, 62%. If you take out every single home in foreclosure today in America, <coughs> home ownership is 59%. We are moving to a renter based society. We are moving to much more density, and this is an indication of that proof point, that what happens in recovery, what happens in recession, it means that people turn to those kinds of real estate asset classes. Look at the home ownership rate and look at the number of, of those in foreclosure and see the difference here. And as that happens, we're seeing way too many people that have still struggles in the single family space. One of my friends who put this slide together for me. They took a look at the survey of, of people that are likely to move and, and who becomes renters. And basically, you take a look at all the homeowners here and say, well, how many of them become renters? 28, or was it 26%? 26% will become renters. That means we have a huge amount of people who did buy homes and are basically renting the homes now and not paying any money off, who may move into multifamily. A proof point that in a recovery and a recession, that will happen. You take a look at the people that are living at home, 18 to 34 year olds that are living at home. You can just see the number of people that are, that are eight, the red line here is the number of people of 18 to 30 year olds that are living at home. So people are pent up demand. And when jobs get created, hopefully at some point in the future, when the economy turns at some point in the future, that pent up demand will go first to what? To rent. Another proof point of what happens in the psychology of real estate. This is read construction data. Take a look at the construction data. Look what's happening. They forecast that. They understand that in psychology and recovery, what happens, the, the trend is northward. It comes out from there. These are positive, positive indicators from that perspective. So where are we in the real estate cycle? You hear about the psychology of it. You see the demographics of it. So where are we in this cycle? Real estate is a cyclical business. And I'm going to make it very simplistic. I know it's not that simplistic. But generally, it lasts about 10 years. It works on that way. And it's impacted by all these primary drivers and secondary drivers. You know, the government, access to capital, and demographic shifts, and supply demand. All the things that are up on that chart. That all affects it. And the government kind of screws things up a little bit. Because it is, if the government wasn't stepping inside so many things here, things might normally go down and normally come up. But they delay it, and they push it, and they move it around, so it's not always perfect. But they're the ones that influence our cycles. But real estate cycles generally last around 10 years. Around 10 years. And they generally begin on the number three, like 83, 93, you'll see that. And they generally end around an eight. And I'll prove to you that in just a minute. Now, it doesn't always work perfectly. And obviously, it's, it, it can be altered by government. It's not geographically the same. It may change by some asset types. I understand all of that. But generally, all of that begins to work in generally 10 year cycles. And all of these cycles have had names. The first cycle that I'll call it that back in the 1980s. And let me just say one thing before I start. Never ever in real estate can you not make money. You make money when it's down, you can make money when it's up. The only reason you do not make money or opportunities is because you fail to change your business model. And fail to recognize the trends and the cycles that are there. Fail to have the leadership and the insight to see where things were going. But this one right here began in 1983. It was the waking of the boomers and entrepreneurism. This is when all the women went back in the workforce. This is when there was an incredible amount of activity. The savings and loans were just flushing out cash. And Texas was one of the huge beneficiaries as much as many other places in the country as well as that. It was a huge awakening and it drove a lot of that entrepreneurism. A lot of stuff that, 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 uh, that, uh, that Ron Tulliker were talking about here, where you had a lot of these new companies were being formed, a lot of these new partnerships were being formed. Lincoln, Paradigm, you're on the list, Come Crow, other. All of these things behind, each one of these, began on this period. But then we got to 1988, and what happened in 1989? We went down, didn't we? That was the period of time went down. We were down for about four years, because in every four years we have that period of transition. And we go into the next cycle, and that was called this, the age of technology and startups. 
1998, that's when the tech, the tech business was growing. Telecommunications, high tech, Silicon Valley, Boston, Austin, uh, uh, Colorado, many other places in Seattle. They were growing because of this technology and the, and, and the startups that were happening and it drove a lot of demand for real estate. The next cycle was this, the age of exuberance and debt. We just went through this. When did it end? About seven or eight, didn't it? That's when we peaked. And we went down the tank after that. And so that was called the age of exuberance and debt. Well, where are we now? We're in the, oh, about to start this new one. 2013. And what are we doing about now? We're covering from the bottom. We're starting to do a little recovery, all right? I'll show you the food points today. And so this is going to be age of consequence and age of consequence and restructuring. Consequence of our actions in the last cycle and restructuring of the opportunities in our industry for the next cycle. That's where this cycle will go. And now when the boomers all retire, they're all toast and out of here by 2018, the new cycle will begin of globalization and knowledge sharing. And this is when the Y generation, the young people, will be taking hold of our, in, of our industry, taking hold of our companies, and creating these kind of opportunities. So this tells you right here that if you're going to get out of real estate, you're going to get a win. About 17 or 18, right? You know, you've got about two or three more year run on some of this stuff, and we're already seeing some markets peaking up right there. So it begins to slow down. You start a project today, make you two, take you two or three years, you're looking at 16 or 17, you'd be already thinking, I don't want to be starting stuff in 2017. I can guarantee you that. So as you look at this, these the cycles, and all of these have that wave curve, and in the, in the growth phase of an opportunity, it comes up here. You can see the, the things that happen. You have rents rising, values rising, NOIs. That's all the growth phase. We're kind of at the bottom of that right now. And we have a plateauing phase. That's where all the folks get slap happy drunk, you know? Um, but they supply demand and balance. They over under, they over under, uh, they overestimate their underwriting. You know, they, they make assumptions they should, they, they should have made. They clearly have unrealistic asset values. Blind entrepreneurism is what I call it now. And so that's going to happen in the plateauing phase, and then you move into the crisis phase, which we just went through, and what was happening there, all those declines. All those declines that happened. Rents, values, and occupancies, and all that. But when you get into this transition phase, the place we're just coming through now, we're coming out of right now, in that place, that's transition. And what happens? New business models emerge. New companies are established. Transitional leadership is taking hold. Young generation is stepping into the fold here. We have recapitalization, diversification of risks, focus on fundamentals. All the things that are on that chart right there. Renewed customer focus. Because as you come out of that, that's what you do in a transition. That's what you do when you're creating those opportunities, creating those places where you can grow and change. And so where are we here? In this 2013 to 2018 period, this is where the opportunities get created. This industry is going to grow. It's going to grow from this recapitalization at $1.7 trillion in real estate that's going to be refinanced or sold or recapitalized that's going to go through there. We're going to see generational shifts. We're going to see the baby boomers are going to be retiring and leaving over this next period of time by, by, by the end of this decade. We're going to see young people taking hold, a change in housing, a change in, 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 in the use of space. We're going to see clearly green technology, education, public infrastructure, the things that drive that demand for real estate activity around transportation centers and things. Knowledge-centered industries. I want to be where the knowledge centers are. This is why we like capital cities that have universities. Raleigh, Austin, other places like that. We also like places around healthcare, hospitals. Those are knowledge centers. In the industry. They create an economic multiplier that is intense and is creative, uh, 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 helpful to the to the local communities. So we like those knowledge center industries, energy, data storage, healthcare. It's all about the renter-based society. You want to place your bets, you place it on the renter-based society. You want sectors. If you're in the commercial side, it's where you want to be. I want to look and say, how do I hook myself to some of these folks here? And there's many more of those. But these industry sectors are growing. These industry sectors are creating opportunities. And the same thing goes through this slide here. From an investment perspective, you can take a look at both risk and reward and see where things are, high risk, low risk, all those things. And as they go there, there are many, many opportunities. It depends on where you want to place your bets. If you want to go and take advantage of the market shifts, Take advantage of the communities that you're in. Take advantage of the state and the region that you're in. You clearly have that opportunity. And so just take a look at that chart. You can see there are opportunities, abundant opportunities, if you have the leadership and the insight and the foresight to go after them.
here's some more proof points, very simply. Look at the wave curve right there, using RCA data, you know, based on sales of the Alaska classes. Look at the wave, it goes up, comes down, now it's starting to come back. What do they tell you? We are in that uptick right now of that, and we're seeing more and more investment sales, and what's gonna happen to $1.7 trillion in more material, 20% of those are the, link, are, are the water? We're gonna see more of that sale volume. This chart will go up, just like it was predictable in the past. We're seeing loan origination. This is from Mortgage Bank Association. Up, down, now going back up. Loan origination, insurance companies, others are stepping in. CNBS market is about $45, $50 billion last year. And more and more and more capital to be placed out there. International capital as well. This wave is coming up. That's another proof point of this happening. Take a look again at reconstruction data for all asset classes. Look at the wave that goes up there. Up, down, up. These are not me talking. This is Mortgage Banker, Reconstruction, RCA, many other people who are speaking this. I just compiled the data and say, look at the proof points that validate that this real estate cycle is real when it's happening, when it's occurring, and how you take advantage of it. That's there for sure. So I'm going to give you some predictions here in the next 10 minutes or so and kind of go from that. These predictions are really based on sort of my, my, my analysis and my looking at where I think things will be over the next 10 years or 10 or 12 years from now. So some of these I want you to make you think. I want you to think about these in ways in which you say, how can I take advantage of this? How does this maybe apply to me? And will all these come true? I don't know. But I know that some of them will have a lot of practicality. So if you're in the office space today, the amount of office space per worker is going to be shrinking to 50 square feet per person. That's already happening today. American Express and a number of others are shrinking out of space to 50 square feet per person. The Marriott and Starbucks and you know, all the things I just showed you about the headlines, that's taking away that office space. So we're going to have far less of that. And 25% of those workers may be club employees, which means they may come in and use space for an hour or two or three or four or use the meeting facilities, but they're not given a dedicated office or a dedicated cube. This is where the 18 to 34 year olds are, 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 are prospering now. And they'll hang out at Starbucks, they'll hang out at Marriott, they'll hang out at other places to do the things that they want to do. That's going to change the nature of the demand for office space. Office buildings are going to shift from eight to six mentality to 24 seven. Why? Why when the building, when everyone leaves at six o'clock at night, the building is dark, but people are paying rent for those next 12 hours until people arrive. We're going to see people using space 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This will affect demand for office space. Because if you're paying rent, why would you want to just vacate the building and say, well, I gotta add more space and more space. Why would you add a shift that comes at three or four o'clock in the afternoon or 10 o'clock at night? And all of those, y'all who have teenagers or 20 year olds, you know they like to sleep until noon anyway, right? So that flip-flop group will come in in the afternoon and they, you know, they like lots of flippers, but they'll be there. My space, my place is to replace my space and opportunities to create virtual offices and connected portals and swarming nests of things. Things that are going to be happening are going to change that. Office space may no longer be leased by square footage, but will leased by consumption. National providers of, real, of office space will combine and will go to Microsoft or go to, to Exxon or others and say, how many units of consumption do you want? I'll sell you 10 million units of consum consumption. You can go to any of my office buildings how you want to use it. You need 20,000 square feet here, just more units of consumption. It'll be commoditized. It will be changed where you don't have to lease, where you sign a lease for 10 years or 15 years and you're fixed into a space. You can use units of consumption, very much like a rewards program here, where you can apply things going out. We're seeing those models coming forward. The future leasing decisions are not being made by the CEO necessarily or the CFO, but were made by the Director of Human Resources. Because the HR is under tremendous pressure to get higher worker productivity out of the employees in an organization. And they're going to look at space configurations and layouts and utilization and 24-7 as a way of doing it. So if you're leasing space or looking for space, you better bond up with the HR directors. Because they're going to clearly have a dramatic influence in the future. Intelligent walls. Why build fixed walls? Have walls that are on tracks, things that can move, reconfigure. Things can all be changed here. The electrochromatic glass. What happens today, this technology exists today. All you have to do is push the screen, the glass in your window that you look outside, it becomes a computer screen. You can Skype, you can take, you can do spreadsheets. You don't need to have a separate space. 
punch the window, there's your screen. Okay, glass on the exterior windows, the interior windows we used for presentations, for modeling, and computer screens. And that technology already exists today, it's already out in place. You can look it up on the internet, it's all there. This is not make believe, this is real, and it's changing them. And so as that begins to happen, pop up workspace, cubicle, exercise facility, all these things begin to change and say the office building of the past will be very, have a difficult time competing in the future without some more dynamic features that are there. And remember, you're trying to recruit 18 to 34 year olds into your space. It better darn well be a green building. It better have a lot of these amenities. It better appeal to the wide generation. Because they do not want to be entire old, decaying, non-green facilities. And so that's part of that. So office is going to go some big changes. Industrial. Industrial is going to go some changes as well. The use of the RV and smart tag. TSA and customs is no longer going to be looking at things as they come in. They will be in China. They will be in Indonesia. They will be in Korea. They will box those up back there. They will be scanned back there. We're going to do it from the point of origin, not the point of arrival. We will change the way that that happens here. Industrial firms are going to employ more technology specialists necessarily than laborers because of the new stacking techniques, the new use of robotics. The widening of the Panama Canal, clearly you all know about that, and that's happening here. It's going to obviously affect places, uh, the ports. So you'll be one of the beneficiaries of that. Charleston, Savannah, and other places will have that beneficiary as well. Because it no longer has to be offloaded on the West Coast, it can go right through there. Buildings will be evaluated more than energy efficiency, and the efficiency of use, and the bays, and the height limitations, whether you can put robotics inside there. This is where it's exciting, because if you have old buildings, they need to be redone. If you have new buildings, you can create greater opportunities if you're ahead of the curve. And the growth around regional transportation hubs is going to be key. We love industrial. It's a steady, steady performer. Never goes up, never goes down. It's kind of a good, steady performer. How many in retail? Raise your hand. God bless you, you're close too. Um, no. But grocery stores. If you have a grocery store, you are going to win. Why? Because grocery stores will, and I'm not talking just about the Walmarts, but I'm talking about the, the, the community grocery store, will become much more like a drop-in center. That's where you're going to get your shops, where you're going to get your, your birth control pills, your medicines, you're going to have uh, flu shops, you're going to have insurance companies, you're going to be able to buy cars, you're going to be able to make payments, you're going to be able to acquire money. You can do all kinds of stuff. Grocery stores are changing dramatically. I'm on the board of one of the largest Hispanic grocery stores in the country. And the number one, the number one product in that grocery store, the number one product is check cash. Several billion dollars of check cash. Because Hispanic people don't trust the bank. Anymore. And they go from work check, paycheck, right? from paycheck to buying. But you take a look right here. So that's going to be on the grocery mall. The consumer's going to become digital shoppers. You're going to program what you want on your iPhone, whatever. You're going to put your little cart down the road here. And every time you pass one of those little things, beep, 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 beep turn to your right. Get two of those. Get three of those. That's how you buy that. That's your size. That's what it is. All this is going to happen, and you'll be told where it is off your phone. You don't have to look at stores anymore. All that's going to be changing them. And the identity products, everyone wants to customize something for them, their size, their shape, their color, their dimension. And so if that happens, it will also change that. We like the age of zone concept in retail. That will change as well. Where you may be in a retail center in the daytime, the service of office workers, you'll have one theme, and at nighttime, you may switch the screens around, switch the, the panels, turn around here, and the menu changes, and now you're a hip crowd for the over 21s. We will see age of zones and changes of what happens. You don't just get one style fixated and stay the same way for 10 or 15 years. Retail will change dramatically. The buy local initiatives, you all know about organic, and you all know about the, 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 the proliferation of the uh, 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 farms you know, that, 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 that occur locally and obviously going down and taking advantage of all those opportunities that are there. Lifestyle retail. There will be an underground economy, a clear underground economy that's there because of that. But sharing retail. What do all the people do when you buy, you buy a stroller, you buy a baby carriage, you buy baby beds and your kids grow up? What do you do with them? There could be these centers to be used for recycling of all that. There will be a lot more predominance of that, a sharing of that. That's what this is about. I also predict that Amazon, by 2020, will be the number one grocer in the country. I think that they will do. I went to presentations by the executive team there. Um, the, the, the plans that are happening are dynamic. And I guarantee if I ask for a show of hands, how many just bought anything on Amazon? Just raise your hand. If you bought something from Amazon, raise your hand. OK, that's like 80% of the room. And they will dominate. They already dominate a lot of the book space. They dominate some of that. It, it just 
And it's the whole technology. My wife is a perfect example of that. She wanted to go buy a coat. I think she wanted to buy like Eddie Bauer or something like that. So she went to Eddie Bauer, tries the coat on, sticks her iPhone, and says, okay, we're going to buy a better price. She finds a better price at a store, Eddie Bauer store in Connecticut. I live in California. Okay? They shipped it for free. She saved $100. She got the coat and didn't buy it at the store that she tried on. Because she used her iPhone. She just said, there, are, there it is. There's the best price. If you go to Amazon, get free shipping, that happens the same way. That's what's changing. And we don't get part of that. And this whole rewards currency part of it. Right now, there's $48 billion of award points given out annually. There's almost 10 trillion frequent flyer miles in existence today. I have about a trillion of them. It's all this long. But in that regard, there's another currency that people are trading using points, using rewards points, using coupon. That's another form of income. And so that changes the way retailers look. Why well, Groupon and others have taken advantage of that. All of that changes, and so it changes the landscape of where retail will be. Apartments we love. Our apartments are going to get much smaller. The 400 square foot size. There's even some that are in New York that are, that are in the 250 square foot size. 250 square feet, it's a little square right here. But it, it's right there. And green features. Custom interiors. People we work with, you can walk in in an apartment rental location, you see the computer screen, you can pick colors, location, size, you can see dimension. You just point, 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 customize what you want in your unit. It's not going to be the same old Navajo white, right? It's going to be different. We also believe that cohabitation will increase by 35 to 45%. We also believe that our 50% of apartments will be smoke free. 50% of those by the 2020, and 20% could be celebrity brand. Well, that won't be the Lindsay Bohan, no. But they'll be celebrity branded. It will be places in which people can identify of where they want to be associated with something or somebody or someplace. Watch for transfer releases pretty fast. There's a Swedish company, one of our clients is, is engaged with a Swedish company that can build an apartment building for 30% let more efficiency and it can do it in 30% fewer time with modular design kind of Swedish technology using lasers and computers and assembly. This is changing our industry. You can put them up quicker, faster, better, more efficient, greater green size. We're also going to see the, I think, you're going to see some national multifamily firms being acquired by a hospitality company. The value of multifamily companies today are undervalued on their multiple basis as if they were not a Marriott apartment property or a Starbucks apartment property. There are going to be changes. Because what is an apartment? It's just a longer stay, right? It's the same kind of thing. We're going to have parking spaces for zip cars, but it's all based on that renter society and how that begins to change. So apartments are going to change dramatically when we get on board from that. And the service companies. When you with a, if you're a service company provider, a property manager, a broker, whatever those might be, real estate firms are going to have standard underwriting practices. We are going to see banks eventually, after they, many of these get closed because of, of um, uh, Dodd-Frank over the next several years, but you will have standard underwriting. The commoditization will require a standard underwriting package that may be prepared, be prepared by a CPA firm, one of the big eight, the big three. You will see a standard underwriting because that's the commoditization. We don't need to re underwrite everything all the time, all the places. And so that will begin to happen. We're going to see investment sales activity increase dramatically. We're going to see a lot of capital. We'll keep some of these cash rates low for a while. We're also going to see the government acting this green legislation I talked about in those headlines before. That will change of how this looks at from a service company perspective. We're going to see multiple listing services, the eBay type services, and 50%, 50% of the brokers that are here today, not in this room, 50% of the brokers in play today will be gone by the end of the decade. We don't need that many brokers. We need people who are advisors and strategists and people who engage in the companies to help them de define their futures, not people that transact purely for a commission and say goodbye after the day. So things are changing pretty fast, aren't they? If you're a service company, we also said the number of service companies will decline 35 to 45 percent. We're going to see all that, a bunch of these firms disappear. There are only going to be three global real estate companies. CBRE, number two may be JLL, and number three is up in the air. And as that begins to happen, you're going to see a proliferation of those firms on a global basis for the global clients. You'll have regional firms and some local firms. But this consolidation is underway. If you can see that happens there, we're going to see the property manager's titles change, change dramatically. 
Um, they're all, I, I think they're, they're enterprise leaders. They're not property managers. They manage relationships. They manage the energy. They manage the community. They manage so much more. They're not property managers. They manage these relationships. Bilingual requirements. If you're in Florida the same way, if you're in Texas the same way, if you're in California the same way, you better know how to speak Spanish. You better know how to deal with that emerging population that's going to be in your facility. We tell our clients in California and Texas, you better get a lot more bilingual folks. You better a lot more uh, diversity in your organization because the governors, the, the tenant governors, the mayors, the county officials, the bank officials, they're going to be Hispanic. And you darn well better be able to play that game or you're going to find yourself behind the curve if that begins to happen. Diversity isn't very important. We think that every single service provider will be required to have one certification of some sort. CPM, CCIM, whatever it might be. But you're going to have to have one certification to require it. And clearly, there's going to be a public market for digital assets. This is underway as well. One of, our, one of our people I work with is developing where you can have a building that will be publicly traded. One building publicly traded on the stock exchange. You can buy shares in that building. Things are changing dramatically in service companies and in all of our sector. And that's exciting. So when you look at the opportunities going forward here, I've taken you through the psychology, the demographics, the real estate cycles. I give you the predictions and the point. The real opportunity is yours. The real opportunity is for you is to take a hold of this transformational time and not say, woe is me, tough economy. You get up and you do something about it. You get up and you change your business models. You get up and recruit young people. You get up and you take a look at where you're going and make sure that you hook your mind with some of the best and brightest in this country, and the opportunities are clearly there. I thank you for the opportunity. I hope I left you with enough to be here. Thank you very much.